please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Halftime Report. Well, for the market, about a half percent gone on the Nifty. And look at some of the stocks which are actually heading lower. So a lot of these OMCs have lost a bit from the top. So IOC is, in fact, now at a 52-week low. And from the top, it's lost significantly. So uh, they're now at the low point of the day. BPCL as well, uh, following a similar uh, line as that. That too has lost quite a bit. In fact, in just... Uh, uh, um, uh, I, I think from the high, it's lost about 3-odd percent. Now, um, outside of the index, look at something like a JN irrigation that too is sitting at the low point of the day and it has lost significant ground actually uh, from the top. So it's now down about 4-5-odd percent. But let's get in some uh, market perspective. We caught up with Arvind Sanger of Geosphere Capital Management uh, to try and get uh, a sense of uh, you know where he thinks the market is headed. He says small caps are already in correction territory. There could be a correction heading uh, for the entire market. In fact, large caps also, he says, would not be insulated. In fact, he doesn't see a lot of flows coming into the Indian market. I don't think uh, the Indian stock market cycle on a long-term basis is over, but I think it is under severe stress this year, and, and we could, we've already got into correction territory for the small caps. Uh, I don't think the overall market uh, is, is bulletproof, and the large caps are bulletproof if oil prices continue to climb as I expect they might. I don't think uh, there is any rush of money coming into this market, either from global investors or certainly from domestic investors. Last year, domestic investors were driving the market. This year, at least, looks like domestic investors are licking their chops and are also uh, looking to take money off the table. The rupee, uh, given where the rest of the currencies have gone, uh, you know, given the inflation differential versus the U.S., has done... Uh, uh, has done quite well. So a moderate depreciation from here uh, really shouldn't mean much. I, I think the real challenge here is that the global headwinds, uh, you know, there was just a taper tantrum fear, but the global headwinds today are somewhat more broad-based and it is uh, not about the taper anymore or about the Fed raising it. It's, it's about trade war. Uh, it's about pressure on China and Chinese currency weakness. And it is about, uh, you know, oil prices going up sharply. I think oil is headed to 85 to 90 dollars. Uh, I may have said, you know, going higher from 80, but I, I, I feel very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, strongly uh, that as we see the Iranian uh, uh, sanctions bite uh, in the next few months, and we get surprised by the fact that lack of infrastructure in the U.S. causes uh, oil exports or oil production growth in the U.S to severely fall short of expectations. If both those happen, which we expect to happen, then oil is going much higher. Welcome back. Keep an eye out on the Asian markets. The Hang Seng has seen some selling pressure from the top. We saw a bit of a recovery in today, but from the top, suddenly that market has corrected nearly around 250 points odd. So keep an eye out on that one. The Shanghai market as well seems to have lost its way. But our markets, we are sitting with a cut of nearly around 50 points. Ashwini had warned us earlier today as well that, in fact, the market was looking quite fragile. So just keep an eye out on that front. Uh, we have the Nifty Bank that's down 125 points. How do you trade uh, the Nifty from here? Ashwini Gujral as well as uh, Rajat Bose, both of them are with us. Uh, good day, gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining in. Ashwini, coming across to you first, uh, what's your reading I mean, uh, in terms of a nifty? What's the trade there? And what about uh, individual stock picks? See, my sense is that the market is getting ready for a collapse. And I say that because now even the stronger stocks are coming off fairly strongly. We had the entire month of June, which was kind of a contraction. That contraction has very good reasons to expand on the downside, macros against you, currency depreciation, crude going up, margins to be raised from uh, next month, etc. So I think at least till, say, uh, you know, to, uh, by the end of the day and even the month of July, uh, I think now the Nifty will also give way. There's only so much the Nifty can do. So right now is a great time to short Nifty, Bank Nifty, because the moment HDFC Bank gives way, I think Bank Nifty could collapse easily 100, 150 points by the end of the day. Having said all of this, uh, you know, Federal Bank is a sell with a stop of 83, target of 75. Exaware is a sell with a stop of 458, target of 437. And uh, National Aluminium is a buy with a stop of uh, 60, target of 68. All right. Uh, uh, so watch out for the second half of trade. Rajat, good afternoon. What are your trading ideas? 
I have one buy and one sell call. Tata LXI June futures. I would sell with a stop above 13.20. Target would be 12.90 and 12.64. I'm expecting some bull liquidation. At least end of clearing bull liquidation to happen out here. And Bharat Forge. Uh, here some short covering is likely. Stop loss below 610 and target would be 629.90. I'm referring to June futures levels in Valve Forge as well. All right, gentlemen, thanks very much for your trading ideas. But let's focus on some individual stocks then. The Britannia stock, that's at a record high. That's seen a jump of 30% in 2018. And so far, uh, in, six, uh, in the last 12 months, it's rallied about 67% in an otherwise weak market. What is driving the stock and what is the outlook for FY19? Varun Berry, the managing director of Britannia, now joins us on the telephone line. Mr. Berry, good afternoon. I'll come to your uh, company specifics in just a bit, but you know, we've almost completed that one year of GST implementation. So my first question to you on exactly that. How has one year been? We spoke with Mr. Mariwala this morning and he said that on ground, the disruptions are almost over. What's the feedback that you're getting, sir? Similar. I think we've, uh, we've seen the government being very, very proactive. So the GST council has been extremely proactive. Uh, in you know any any issues that come up, they react very very quickly and get these solutions uh, solved in a very practical way. So uh, I think that's moving quite well. <clears throat> the buoyancy in the tax collection obviously is showing that uh, you know we the last two quarters have been uh, fairly good in terms of compliance. Uh, even our business growths are, have been <clears throat> definitely better than what they were earlier. So things are moving in the right direction. I think uh, GST has definitely simplified the entire indirect tax process. And, um, you know, it, I, I think that this obviously is uh, the very initial stage, the first year. And in the first year, for the first year, I think it's been great performance. All right, uh, Mr. Berry, so that's about GST. Let's talk about Britannia then. You know, quarter four looked good. Double-digit volume growth is what we saw. What's the outlook for FY19? Can we expect a double-digit volume growth? We, we don't give any outlook, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. But uh, as I said, uh, the momentum is, is coming back uh, slowly, and uh, we are hoping that it continues. Uh, you know, leading up to the election year, hopefully uh, we will be able to see some more momentum as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Berry, this is Manglam here. Uh, I understand you don't give any outlook, but if we take a look at uh, the first half last year, you had 3% uh, volume growth, you had 5.8% volume growth, so we're working with a low base. First half at least, double digit is a possibility. Can, can, can one expect that? Manglam, it's, it's, you know, it, it's something, as a policy, we don't give any outlook, and I think it's not right to... Uh, so so I, I don't think uh, I'm going to uh, fall for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, all right, so let's. Uh, in that case, we'll try try talk about the demand scenario. How has demand panned out so far? Urban, how much does that account for your in your revenue? Rural, how much does that account for in your total revenue? What is the demand growth that you're seeing in both these uh, both these segments? So the demand growth is, it has been reasonably good. I would say uh, not a big uh, change from what it was, but we've seen about a 200, 250 point increase uh, in overall industry growth. So uh, from that perspective, uh, still single digit. It's not like a, you know, a double digit industry growth. And we certainly are waiting for that time when the industry overall starts to look at uh, a double digit growth. But uh, definite, uh, definitely a move in the right direction. All right. Uh, let's talk about the margin picture then, Mr. Berry. You know, uh, margins have been improving. Quarter four was very, very good. I don't think we're going to get a number from you uh, in terms of a guidance. But um, FY18, I think around 200, 220 crores of cost savings was something that Britannia could do. For FY19, are you expecting to do a repeat of that sort? And can you hold on to these kind of margins that you've delivered in the past year? So cost savings is now a part of our culture. And uh, just to let you know that these cost savings are never counted again, right? So whatever cost savings that we've done last year, the clock starts on, you know, the first day of the year and ends on the last day of the year. And uh, anything that is over and above that is counted in our cost savings. So it's a very stringent way of looking at costs. And yeah, yes, we are looking at, uh, yeah. you know, our budget is... Uh, 
a higher number than what we did last year. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so certainly we are looking at uh, you know areas of cost. Savings. Last year was 220 crores approximately. Yes. Okay. All right. So this year you're looking at maintaining that or maybe doing a tad bit better, right? So we can yes. expect a saving of around 220 to 250 crores. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Berry, another question for uh, the year ahead then. How are you looking at the kind of uh, increasing competition coming in from the likes of, uh, say, what ITC's new launches, there's Platina from Parley, etc. Um, is there any sort of uh, uh, further augmentation of your ad strategy or, uh, you know, new launches, etc.? What do you have in mind? Well, yes, we've got uh, a fairly good uh, innovation pipeline and... Uh, it's actually, you know, we've we've started to get ready for some of the big launches, mm. uh, and uh, you will see a lot from our portfolio. There's going to be a lot of addition to what we uh, do in terms of uh, in in every segment. So we are looking at, as you are aware of, uh, the, the entire croissant um, launch is uh, is also in in, in November. So, and, you know, similarly in biscuits, uh, cake, rusk, uh, some other categories that we are looking at, this year is going to be a very, very exciting year for uh, Britannia. So, in the remainder of this year, Varun, what are the, project, uh, what are the products which are uh, due for launch? What is the timeline? And the dairy business, that is something that the street is pretty excited about as well. So, when can we see the first rollout of that dairy product? The dairy product will not happen this year for sure. Because, uh, you know, we are in the process of, it's, it's a slightly longer lead time because mm -hmm. you've got to get the milk collection piece uh, sorted out and then you've got to do the milk processing piece. So that's going to be uh, at least an 18 to 24 month project. So that won't happen this year. There will be innovations in dairy, uh, not from our plant, but, but certainly innovations from dairy. But there are going to be some new-to-market products in biscuits. There are going to be some new-to-market product products in cakes. Uh, and similarly, there are going to be some very exciting products outside of the categories that we operate in. So I can't talk about that right now, but you'll, you'll see it towards the end of the last quarter of this year. All right. So the last uh, couple of launches that you did, you know, the likes of Good Day Wonder Fills, you did Deuce, uh, which has been pretty tasty, to be very honest. Uh, uh, there were the Treat Cream business, bis Biscuits as well, the relaunch out there. How much does that account for in your revenue? And going forward, the new launches, how, how important would be in, in your overall scheme uh, of things? What kind of salience? do you expect from new launches coming into your overall uh, scheme of things? So the innovation target that we have uh, is about 5% of our revenue. Uh, so that's what our entire innovation portfolio adds to our uh, total revenue. And uh, we have been, uh, you know, uh, fairly close to that for the last year as well. Uh, so we are hoping that we'll be able to achieve and maybe overachieve that uh, in the current financial year. All right. A word on increasing distribution. You know, over the last four years, uh, your distribution has grown about two and a half times, from close to 7.3 million outlook, uh, outlets to about eight and a half, 18 and a half million outlets. Uh, where does that target go in this year, two years from now? So as we speak, it's about 19. Okay. So uh, we are continuously adding outlets and making sure that our distribution goes wider, uh, especially in our weak areas, which is the Hindi belt. So that, that will continue, I think, till we get to about 2.5 million outlets. I think the pace will be uh, fairly good in the next uh, two or three years. Uh, mm -hmm. After that, we'll have to consider, uh, you know, how, how fast or how, you know, how do we get to these outlets, the rest of the outlets. So that's the time when we'll start to take some different measures. But the next two to three years, the pace is going to continue. All right, Mr. Berry, I remember in your last con call, you were talking about premiumization as well as innovation, and FY19 is going to be a benchmark here. So let's keep that aside for the time being. Let's talk about the international business then. It contributes roughly around 15% of the total revenues out there. What's the no, no, opportunity? No. How, how no, much no. does it contribute? No, it contributes about 7% of the revenue. 7% as of now. All right. What's, yeah. the, what's the opportunity out there? Are you seeing a faster growth out there? Are you looking at some kind of acquisitions? Um, could that be a possibility in the international market? It certainly could be a possibility, uh, but it's not the only strategy that we are looking at. Uh, the growths in the international market uh, have not been uh, as fast as our domestic growths in the last couple of years. The reason for that is that uh, a bulk of our international business is out of the Middle East. 
which certainly is a troubled geography uh, and trouble because of certain countries completely shutting down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we are opening out some markets, and uh, you know the highlight is that we opened up uh, Nepal, which we are putting up a plant in as we speak. And uh, you know, despite having no manufacturing facility, just from exports, we've become market leaders in that country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and it's a large business. It's not like a small business. And we are hoping that once we have a, f a facility there, once we have a manage manufacturing facility, we can scale that country up and make it, uh, you know, a, a larger business for us. Uh, similarly, there are other markets that we are looking at. Um, you know, obviously, exports is something that we uh, are growing pretty rapidly, especially Southeast Asia. Uh, even Australia, you know, our, our growths have been fairly good, fairly robust. Even the Americas, uh, you know, North America, Canada, our growths right. have been fairly robust. But now we are looking at how do we set up uh, businesses by having uh, a full-fledged manufacturing operation in some critical markets which where we have a right to succeed. Right. Varun, you know, before we let you go, since the time you've joined, about seven and a half times growth in the company's market cap, you've been good for the promoters. Are they looking to sell stake in the company? <laughs> no, no, they are not. Let me be categoric about that. All right. Okay. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Berry, for stopping by and giving us uh, all those details. All the best for the remainder of this year. But uh, I think we should focus on the markets right now. The Nifty has moved towards the 10,600 markets, not looking very, very good. We're at the low point of the day, mind you. We saw a bit of a pullback, but that quickly got sold into even good high pedigree stocks. You know, the Bajaj FinServs, the Bajaj Finance of the world, both those two have come in for some selling pressure. So it's not looking very, very pretty, actually. Let's get the end of day chart of both those two stocks. Nifty stocks, just take a look at that. Bajaj FinServ as well as Bajaj Finance, both of them seeing some selling pressure. Slip into a short break, come back. We'll continue our focus on the markets. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, the European markets a tad bit weak, actually. So uh, the FTSE is down uh, close to about a half odd percent. I think even the DAX is taking a bit of a hit. The CAC, though, uh, just uh, about flat for now. Okay, uh, So the FTSE now down about a quarter odd percent. Not as bad, actually, as I checked just a while back. But over to Manisha Gupta then for a quick roundup of all that's taking place in the commodity space. Manisha. So, Mera, thank you so much for that. Let's start with crude oil prices, which after 3.5% gains overnight have seen some profit taking come in. The prices, in any case, had gained 7% in five trading sessions. So, you are looking at half a percent of a decline, but 5,000 on crude MCX is still holding on your screens. What I also want to bring on a screen is the gold prices. They have been constantly declining. $12.50 per ounce that we are trading at right now in the global markets is the new 2018 lows. Those are the levels that you saw last in December. The gold prices actually have come down by nearly 8% since the month of April. We were trading around 13.66 at that point. That's an April high. From 13.66 to 12.50 and below is how gold is on your screens right now. Of course, it has to do with the fact that the U.S. dollar has been strong. Uh, the U.S. interest rate hikes are expected to be more and near in 2018 and beyond. And then, of course, Europe is also talking about putting a timeline on ending its QE. And then, of course, equity markets have given better returns this year. But all of that perhaps could be changing because gold does seem oversold in the international markets. Another important thing to watch really is that even as uh, uh, you have seen the gold prices decline 8% in last three months, rupee has continued to depreciate. So we haven't seen that kind of a sharp fall in the Indian markets because the rupee depreciation has been a bit of a cushion here in India. But will the lower prices actually lead to some demand improvement is something that the markets would want to watch. Ranisha Chanani now joins in for uh, more on that and strategies as well. Ranisha, hi, what is your sense, especially for gold, with the kind of very sharp declines that we have seen on that? Hi, Manisha. Good morning. I think overall, uh, you know, entire commodity space is going through a risk of sentiment and we have seen a lot of selling going through because other uh, asset classes are also not performing. So there is selling across the board in equities and commodities and that is the reason why gold and silver has also been sold off. But we have seen that both the uh, commodities are trading at the important support levels, uh, roughly around $12.50 for gold and $16 for silver. I think this is, you know, a very important support level and prices should take a uh, support here and take a rebound from here. 
Uh, for intraday, I would recommend uh, uh, clients to, you know, wait. Uh, if prices sustain above 30,700, then I would recommend to buy gold. And similarly for silver, I'm expecting if 40,400 is sustained, then only one should enter into buy position for the targets of 40,800. Overall, I'm, uh, you know, thinking that there could be a consolidation phase over here, and then prices could rebound from this important support levels unless we see a negative trigger. So I don't think there is a negative trigger that is coming in the next two days. So prices could get a support here and somewhat bottom fishing from this levels. Well, absolutely. There actually hasn't been a negative trigger at all in gold and silver, but we somehow haven't seen the money flow into this space. So even as gold is trading at a 2018 low, silver also is trading at a seven-week low. Between gold and silver, where do you see a better opportunity? I mean, clearly, all of this year, we've had experts tell us that silver is a better buy bet here. Uh, when do you see that actually materialize now? Yes, uh, throughout this year, we have been saying that, you know, uh, silver could outperform gold, uh, looking at the gold-silver ratio, which is trading around 80. Uh, and I still think, yes, uh, silver could outperform gold uh, when the rebound actually starts. Silver needs to sustain above $17. Then only we'll see silver outperforming gold. So I'm betting that is $17 to, you know, break and sustain. Then only silver will outperform. Uh, then we could see silver prices heading towards $19 and $20. But that follow-through buying should come. Uh, at least uh, I'm expecting next quarter could see some, you know, follow-through buying for uh, precious metal back. So somebody who is uh, waiting for accumulating, this is the right time to invest in and start accumulating gold and silver both. Nigel, if you are ready to accumulate gold and silver, this is the time. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks so much for that, uh, Radisha, as well as uh, Manisha. Well, that's an interesting prospect. Maybe I should look at that. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For the time being, the markets are down nearly around 50 points. We'll slip into a snappy break. You come back. We'll continue our focus on the markets. Stay with us. That stock saw a sharp decline. It was down more than 4%. Now that stock is moving more or less flattish. So let's get the intraday chart of share infra as well up for you on the screen. Let's get that up. Uh, I think it's trying to move into the green as we speak. But we'll wrap up on the show. As we do that, do remember to catch our special coverage, GST Decoded, one year on, this evening at 6.15 p.m. onwards, where Finance Secretary Hash Mukadia, along with Finance Ministers of States, Thomas Isaac, Manpreet Singh Badal, Morvin Godino, they'll share their perspectives on the mega tax reform in the presence of an audience comprising of CEOs, CFOs, top tax consultants, and economists. Stay with us, Business Lunch comes up next.